firstly, it's, uh, it's great to be here this morning. Um, just to give a bit of an idea about myself, my name is Conor Cusack. I come from a very small place down in Klein, um, in East Cork. Um, this is my, I'm still hurling, this is my 20th year of pre-season. Um, by looking at me, I probably need a bit more work, uh, a few more weeks of it, I think. Um, I'm still only a young man, only 35, but I came from an era when you were 14 or 15 and you were anyway good enough. You were thrown in with the big lads, but thankfully, thankfully those days have changed now. I um, was fortunate enough uh, to play a bit of hurling with Cork for a couple of years um, in the mid-2000s. Unlucky to come along at a time when the, the greatest hurling team of all time was, was emerging in Kilkenny. Um, I think I hold the record, I've said this before, as, uh, as, as having the record of being the fastest man to come on, come off and come on again in an All-Ireland final. Um, we were here in 2006, um, there was about eight or nine minutes left in the game and Kilkenny were beating us by about 10 or 11 points. And Joe Cunningham came up to the subs bench and he said, Cusick, come on, we need you to go on there to, to get a few goals. And I was here to myself thinking, it isn't me, you need no all, it's God and a miracle. But anyhow, <laughs> ran down and there was a break in the play, we had a free in the back line and... Um, there was some guy injured, so I ran in, long, in into, the, into the corner forward position. I remember Sean Leary, the famous cock hurler, telling me that if you want to get goals, stay in close to the edge of the square. So we were going in there, and uh, as I was standing in there, I could hear this voice in the corner in the, in, 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 in the distance, and I looked out the side, and John Allen, our manager, was there, and he was doing that to me, and I was thinking, right, he wants me to step out a bit from the edge of the square, so I moved out a small bit, and standing there, and this, and I could hear, still hear the same voice, and I looked out, and he was doing the same thing, so I stepped out a bit further. And as I did, he was still doing the same thing. So I ran out to the sideline and I said, Jesus, John, I said, if I'm going to go any further, I'll be out to the sideline. He said, he said, get off the effing field. You haven't even been brought on yet, he said. <laughs> so I had the indignity of having to go up the line and I can assure you the Kikini supporters weren't uh, wishing me well or anything like that and uh, had to wait around to be brought back on again. But anyhow. Um, <laughs> so when Liam O'Neill announced at the launch of the Gaelic Players Association, we were more campaign that we need to allow our boys to cry. It was a profound and brave statement from the leader of an organisation that is seen in many ways as the bastion of masculinity within our country. Like many others, he's witnessing all around him the tragic consequences of how as a society, and in some ways as a sporting organisation, we've participated in framing a very narrow and defined structure of what it is to be a man in this world, and in some ways also a woman. This structure is shaking though. Its foundation revealed to have not been the solidity of stone of fact, but rather built on an illusion and a caricature that fails to reflect the immense depth and vastness that exists within each human being. Through cultural conditioning and antiquated attitudes, depending on your gender, there were certain aspects of your being that society determined were acceptable to engage with and express, and others that had to be kept buried and repressed within. The current crises that are facing the well-being issues of our people are exposing how the dogmas of the past, the clinging to tradition, are proving to be wholly inadequate in dealing with the st our stormy present. And the proof surrounds us of how these archaic views, views are failing to cohere with our deepest needs as human beings. Despite all the cover-up and illusion and sometimes deception that we engage in as human beings, our outer actions give visible evidence to the hidden disenchantment that exists within. Gandhi once said, truth alone will endure, all the rest will be washed away before the tide of time. The truth that time will never wash away, and he had on mentioned it briefly there in his talk, is that our deepest needs as human beings is to be loved unconditionally and to be able to love, to belong to ourselves unconditionally and to belong to something outside of ourselves. These are intangibles, naked to the invisible eye, but dwelling forcefully within the hearts and minds of all of our people. All around us, we see the legacy of these fundamental human needs not being met sufficiently. People filling this void through unhealthy eating or overconsumption of alcohol. Addictions to gambling, to work, to success. The ever-increasing amount of people that are self-harming, experiencing depression, and those people that are ending their precious lives through suicide. We easily see the signs. We easily see the signs. We continue to continually fail to understand the hidden layers of meanings behind them. We focus on the symptoms and we fail to see the person. The legendary American physician Hunter Adams once said, when you treat a disease, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But I guarantee you, when you treat a person, you always win. How are we really treating each other in association? Are we only valuing our people for what they give? 
instead of what they really need, which is to be valued and appreciated for themselves first and foremost? Are we praising our children and our kids only for what they achieve? Perhaps living our own sporting lives through them and confusing their sense and valuing of their own unique selves with their successes or failures on the sports field. We've educated our coaches and continue to do so in the area of tactics, tactics and techniques and all of that. But are we educating them in perhaps the most fundamental thing, emotional intelligence? <laughs> in times of our people's distress, which is inevitable in the world we live in, are we still continually darkening the spirit and hearts of our young men with those deadening words, be a man, be a man. How many people inside this room have so often heard that? Liam O'Neill's vision and others' vision is not about making our men less men, but allowing them to be more human. It's about allowing them to be the aggressive, competitive, and at times savage warrior that our wonderful and exciting games demands of them. It's about our, allowing our administra administrators to continue to be the ambitious, driven, and passionate men that they are to develop and grow our association. It's about allowing all of that, but it's also about freeing and developing new possibilities where we can allow our people to engage with other aspects of themselves and where they can be comfortable with expressing empathy, compassion, caring, and kindness, and most of all, empowering our people to be able to embrace their emotional and physical well-being challenges. And you know, we often hear of the word sports psychologists and, and people within the GA use the word mental toughness. It's bandied about a lot, but you know, what is mental toughness? I gave a talk recently in Dungannon and Tyrone with Oshie McConville, uh, the legendary RMR footballer. And you know, I watched, witnessed that man lots of times. I won't say that I, I went to see too many football games because down where I come from in Klein, if there's football, the older lads come along with pitchforks and puncture them and all that. But <laughs> um, I remember watching that man on television a lot and seeing the incredible freeze he got and the scores that he got at critical times and hearing all these people talk about how mentally tough Oshie McConville was. But Oshie McConville told us that night up in Dungannon that because of the addictions and the difficulties that he had, when his dad was diagnosed with cancer and was dying, that he was unable to be there for his dad because of the difficulties that he had. He wasn't able to be for, there for his dad in that moment when he most needed him. And now he has huge regrets in his life about that. Is that mentally tough? Is that the environment that we want our people to continue to be involved in, where they don't feel that they can find the support and be able to come forward and deal with whatever issues that they have. Can you imagine inside in this room if, <laughs> if there was 10 people that had a life-threatening challenge or difficulty? We'll say, for example, the front row that we have here, if the 10 people here on the front row had some bit of a, a, a condition, we'll say like cancer, and we know that if people go away and get the support and help, whatever they may need, that there's a great chance that they're going to recover their health and well-being. Can you imagine if in that 10 people here today, that if only two or three of them came forward to get some support and help? You kind of be asking yourself the question, Jesus, what's going on? What's, what kind of a world or environment are, are we living in that only two or three people will come forward and get that support that we know would help them? That's the reality for many of our people that are experiencing well-being issues, whether it's with toxic levels of stress and anxiety, or depression or anxieties, or whatever the case may be. That's the reality that only two or three out of 10 are coming forward to, experiencing, uh, to, to get the support with that. It's a shocking thing to think about that that still exists in our country. But these health and well-being issues are not unique to Ireland. I've witnessed on my travels all over the world over the last 18 months to speak at events that these are global issues. What is different in Ireland, though, is that the, and what these other countries don't have, is that we have a unique sporting organisation that is part of the very DNA of this country, and a country whose heartbeat ebbs and flows to the rhythm and excitement of our games. An organisation that is owned by nobody, but belongs to all. That, a glue that links the smallest of villages to the biggest of cities, from the tip of Maddenhead to the top of Mizzen Head and everywhere in between. Where a young person, no matter their race, gender, socioeconomic background or sexuality, can be given a piece of ash, fashioned from the wonders of nature, and become a master craftsman in one of the greatest sports on earth. 
I'm talking about hurling now for all those football people that are here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> We're the academic and tradesmen, the young and the old, the player that wants to reach the pinnacle of a sport or the player that just wants to participate. Where all of these people can mingle in a communing and joyous alchemy with, with the administrator and the referee, the jersey washer and the liner of the fields. And where all of these people can come and share their unique presence, gifts and talents to support each other, to achieve whatever it is they want to achieve and to fulfil whatever their needs are. In a world that increasingly and at times unhealthily worships at the altar of success, it can be easy to belittle that pursuit of success, but playing small and dreaming small benefits nobody in the community. The spirit of every club should be to create the structures that allow their players to be their best in their sporting, their personal and their professional lives. However, we are in danger of a society of only valuing what ends well. The final product, the end of year trophy cabinet, the desire for destination at times obliterating the journey. More than ever in the GA, we need to celebrate the joy and at times the sorrow, but ultimately the richness of that lifelong GA journey. And the shared experiences that no money can buy or the accumulation of trophies that can never adequately replicate that. The wins and losses, the dreams and hopes shattered, the falling out with people and the falling back in. The bots, the marriages, the divorces, the deaths. The excitement at the sight of the first pods of grass on a new GA field. The anxiety about how we're going to bloody pay for it. Planting the seeds now of generating a culture where the development of our people's inner growth is as important as the organisation's outer growth will reap a rich harvest for wider society and have a far more profound impact on the well-being of our people. We need to harness, and we are in many, many ways, and Brendan will focus on that in, in his talk, the immense potential for our fields, our meeting rooms, our ball alleys and our dressing rooms to become sacred sanctuaries, sacred sanctuaries, where our people's vulnerabilities and difficulties can receive support and healing and people's real and authentic selves can find expression. The message needs to ring out loud and clear from Crow Park here this morning, that we are more than our stadiums, we are more than our committee rooms, we are more than our successes and failures, we are more than our inevitable conflicts and bickerings and arguments, we are more than our blanket defences and one-on-one -on -one penalties. We are them, we are all of them, but we are more than that again. More than anything else, we are our people. I go all over the world, and it's an incredible thing to think that of all the billions of people that have ever lived, and all of the billions of people that will come after us, there'll never again be another person exactly like you in the world. Never again another person exactly like you. No one that'll look like you, nobody that'll think like you, nobody that'll walk like you, or kick a football like you, or swing a holly like you, or give out like you, or be cranky like you, or be joyous like you. Nobody. It's an incredible thing to think of. You're a unique, once off, phenomenon in the universe, never again to be repeated, priceless beyond measure. I read a small bit about quantum physics. I absolutely understand 99.9% .9 of it I don't understand, but about 0.1% of it I do, and I read it to try and think that I'm clever. But quantum physicists have shown, quantum physicists have proven that the calcium in our bones, that the carbon in our muscles, that the iron in our blood once belonged to long-vanished stars that exploded. The old church saying of from dust you have come and to dust you shall return is only partly true. It's dust all right that you're made of, but it's stardust. It's stardust. I can remember when I was starting to find out about this actually playing a game with Klein and I was after scoring three or four goals and I was coming off the field after the match. There was an old man outside the world and he said, Jesus, cues a fair play by your star. And I was about to, I said to him, do you know what, you're right, I am a star, <laughs> literally. And, And I was, about, I was about to get into the discussion about, about quantum physicists and quantum physics and all that, but I said, you know what, we leave it maybe for the, for the pub later on after a couple of points, we might, we might all understand it a bit. But if that's true for you, if that's true for you, then it means it's also true for the person alongside you. It means it's also true for the person in your club. So why then, why then would you not treat and value and appreciate this incredible, unique things that you have inside in your club. It's why I believe, it's why I firmly and strongly believe from the bottom of my heart that the health and well-being comedies that have been developed and springing up all around our club are perhaps the most important 
that have ever, have ever performed in our country or in, 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 our, in our association. And it's why I believe that your roles, the role of the Health and Wellbeing Club Officer or Committee Member is a sacred, a sacred and a special role. We are all the sole inhabitants and silent witnesses to our own inner worlds. And dwelling behind the masks that we eat through our daily, mixed in with our dreams and our hopes and our ambitions, or our fears and our doubts and our worries. Sometimes those walls can be engulfed in toxic levels of stress and anxiety or darkness. However, there isn't enough darkness in all the world that can snuff out the light of one small candle. There's enough darkness in the world that can snuff out the light of one small candle. I gave a talk recently, and at the end of it, I was leaving the community hall at about 12 o'clock. This man came up to me, an old man, told me he was 72 years of age. And about six months before that, he started to feel this darkness inside in his life. But he came from an era where he was told, be a man. So he felt he couldn't do anything about it. And a few months into that, he lost the love of his life, his wife, of 45 years. And he kept on spiraling into this place of darkness. And he'd been a member of a GA club, but uh, he, he'd fallen out and hadn't been in a committee for a few years, so there was nobody else in his life. And so he got to the point where he decided there was nothing more for him that he could do. So he got to going out of his shed, and walked down to the river's edge, and to use his words, he wrapped his lips around the shotgun and was about to pull the trigger. And just as he was about to pull the trigger, his little dog that belonged to himself and his wife came into his view. The thought flashed into his head, who's going to look after the dog? And it was enough to snap him out of the difficulty that he was in. And he came to the talk and he was able to bring him back to his family and he's in a bit of support and he's doing really, really well now. That little dog was his candle. What's to say that you or your club or something that you do inside in your club for somebody in distress that you could be the candle for that person? That you could be a lantern that could illuminate the path for that person to be able to emerge from their darkness and back into a network of support and love. When I think of what's happening with the health and wellbeing committees, you know, I worked for Doreen Allen, the famous chef one time, and she told me that, you know, if you're ever adding a new ingredient to a recipe, you never do it to replace anything. You only ever add an ingredient to enhance the rest of the other ingredients and make it a more powerful and satisfying product at the end. The health and well-being sections and people and, and communities that are emerging within our association are a new ingredient in some ways, but we're not here to replace anything. We're here to work with and support and enhance the existing structures that exist within the GA to help it to become an even more powerful and enriching entity in serving the lives of our members. We need to pave the way for a more understanding association and continue to strengthen and promote the holistic growth of our members and tear down the walls of stigma and taboo that surround many of the well-being difficulties that our people are experiencing. We need to end the days of the strong, silent man or the woman that will just put up with it. We need to end the days of telling our young boys, be a man, big boys don't cry. This, in some ways, is a moving out of the safe territory of all behaviours into the unexplored and what will be at times resisted and scoffed at by others. I can understand people's fears, but we can no longer be at ease in the old dispensational way of being. You know, a young seagull, when it's born on the cliff's edge, it nestles in the sanctuary of its, of its nest and it stays there, you know, for a period of time and mother or father comes and gives us a bit of food and stuff like that, but eventually something deep within kind of encourages it to kind of step out of the nest and kind of step up to the cliff's edge and into a bit of uncharted territories. And, you know, I can imagine for that young bird that hasn't flown before, standing on that cliff's edge that is full of fear and anxiety, but eventually it kind of summons this courage and with a bit of faith and belief, you know, it jumps into the unknown and far from falling, far from falling, it soars into a new and exciting world for itself. My belief is that the challenges that our people are facing, the challenges that our society are facing, are not to be feared but to be embraced. And that in their own unique and strange and bewildering way, that they're trying to force us to the cliff's edge. And that they're trying to, for, to force us to recognize that there's something new. Something that will show up the limitations and the confined cages that perhaps we've accepted for ourselves as human beings. My belief is that through the work of the Health and Wellbeing Associations in, in our club, 
that by us being brave and stepping up to the cliff's edge and through a bit of faith and belief and by leaping into the unknown, that we too will not fall. We too will not fall but soar and rise with the challenges and the challenges that our people and our society are facing. And in doing so, we will help to strengthen the greatest organisation, sporting organisation in the whole world. To finish with, Gautama Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, when trying to capture how short our lives actually are, once said, this existence of ours is as transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance in a lifetime, like a flash of lightning rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. We stopped on our cosmic journey to encounter each other, to meet, to love, to share, to play hurling and football, to argue and give out and fall in love and fall out of love and all of those things. This is a precious moment, but it's temporary. It's temporary as the life of young Donald Walsh and Kerry has so vividly shown. If we in our association can perhaps share that time with a bit more caring, a bit more kindness, a bit more authenticity, and even a bit more love, we can ensure that all of our members can find their own voices, can live their lives to the rhythm and beat of their own drum. And for those that are engulfed in darkness and anxiety, can emerge out of that into a network of love and support. And then, and then perhaps, our time and our era on this planet will have been worthwhile. None of us can walk another person's path for them, but we can certainly walk it with them. Through the health and well-being comedies that we're emerging in our association, we can ensure that all of our people, that we can all walk together. And I wish you all the very best in that journey ahead. Thank you very much.